we're finally going to write some code. To finish this chapter, we're going to write some simple programs without any automated tests. For now, we want to focus on Python basics like folder and file structure, naming conventions, and some basic syntax. There are two challenges in this lesson, but we'll do the first one together. For challenge one, create a program that asks the user for their first name and then their last name. Use these inputs to print the following sentence. Your full name is whatever they pass in for their first name and then whatever they pass in for their last name. This seems pretty straightforward, but there are quite a few pieces we need to go over to make sure we're following best practices as well as understand the code we're working with. To start off, we'd like to organize our code using folders, also known as directories. So we're going to start by right-clicking on my project root, the Auto Engineering 101, going up here to New, then Directory, and I'm going to call this Chapters. Within Chapters, create another folder called Chapter 1. And then within the Chapter 1 directory, we're going to make a file and we're going to call this first underscore program dot py. Already we've created a few things and so I want to pause here for a sec to go over them. First off, any folder that has at least one Python file inside of it is considered a Python package. So in our case, chapters has no file within it. So it's just a regular folder. However, chapter one has first program.py, meaning that chapter one is a Python package. Next, I also talked about a project root. This is good to know because anytime that we're referencing the project root, we're talking about everything that exists at the highest directory or the highest level folder. In my case, this is auto engineering 101 and everything within this would be considered at the project root. Just look what happens when I minimize this. When I expand it, you can see that chapters is at the project root. Venv, this orange bar here, is at the project root. And so is my git ignore and readme file. Another thing to note is that everything within Python for my folders and my files were named using lowercase letters. Any names that had multiple words in it, like first program, were separated by underscores. This formatting is called snake case, which makes sense since we're dealing with Python, right? Python, snakes, bada bing, bada boom. Last thing to touch is that Python files end with the .py extension. So we know that first program is a Python file because we end it with first program dot py or simply dot py. Within first program dot py, we're going to add the following code to print our name. We'll start by calling print and then passing in our name. Then right click anywhere in the file to open up a context menu and we're going to click this run first program. Clicking this will execute this file and you'll see here that our name is printed to the terminal. Let's pause here for a bit to break down what we just did. We used the built-in print function that comes with Python out of the box. A function is a reusable snippet of code that performs some action and sometimes returns a result. In this case, the print function just prints things to the terminal. We then added these parentheses to activate the function. If we were to simply type print, that wouldn't work. So by using these parentheses, we are now activating or executing this function. This is known as calling the function. 
The next thing we did is pass in our name. We do this because the print function will print whatever we pass into it. So in this case, when we passed our first and last name, that's what we got back in the terminal. To test this theory, let's open the Python console, aka the REPL, and add a print statement to see what gets printed out. But I'm going to type print 1 plus 1. What do you think this is going to print to the terminal? Press enter, and you probably guessed it, we got back too. The REPL is a great way for us to quickly try code out and see what we get back. We will be using it in this course, but it's a great tool to add to your tool belt as a Python developer. You'll probably be using it quite a bit. Oh, and by the way, REPL stands for read, evaluate, print, and loop. We will be using more built-in functions, but we'll also eventually be writing our own functions too. You may have noticed that we didn't just type our name into the print function. We added quotes around it, right? That's because our name is a string. Wait, what's a string, Carlos? Well, I'm glad you asked. A string is a sequence of characters surrounded by quotes. That's not the official definition, but that's really all it is. It could be a word, a sentence, a paragraph, or basically anything else. Let's take a look at some examples. On lines 1, 4, and 7, we start it with this hashtag or pound sign. This tells Python that this is just a comment, just something that it shouldn't be run, it's not code. We're mainly using it for documentation for ourselves. Next up on line two, I'm gonna hold my name in this variable called my underscore name and just put in Carlos Kidman. On line five, we have a much longer sentence, a cow jumped over the moon. And then on line eight, we have a variable called WTF, and we're basically holding some random gibberish. But that's still a single string. Let's right click anywhere in the file, and instead of doing run first program, if you go down further, there's an option to run file in the Python console. Let's click on that and see what we get. All right, here's the REPL that we all know and love, but also notice how on the right-hand side, it's showing our variables. Here's my name, which it knows is a string called Carlos Kidman, a sentence variable, and a WTF variable as well. So inside of the Python console, we can then start printing these things. Let's put sentence in here, and what do you think is going to be printed? Press enter, and we got a cow jumped over the moon. Let's print WTF, and yep, it printed out that gibberish. And whoa, we just went over variables and how to assign them without even realizing it. In programming, you can use variables to hold values and then use them later on. The cool thing about this is that we can call the variables anything we want and basically assign anything to them. We had my name, sentence, and WTF, and assign each of them three completely different string values. Also, notice that all of the variable names we used were using the snake case format. To spice things up even more, we're going to use what we've learned so far to get input from the user. We can do this using the built-in input function. This function asks the user to enter some information and then returns it back to you, the developer. A real-world example of this is when you make a new character in a video game and you're asked to name them. You enter a name and your character is now magically called that. Let's start by creating a variable to hold the value they give us. Favorite animal is equal to input and then whatever they give us back. So let's ask the question, what is your favorite animal? 
press enter, and you'll actually see that the REPL changes from the three greater than signs to now this greater than question mark. This is now the program asking the user to type something in. So I'm gonna put dog, because that's my favorite animal. And here on the right hand side, we can see that favorite animal is now equal to dog. You can try it a few more examples if you'd like, like here I'll put sport, uh, and then input, what is your favorite sport? And I'll put soccer. And there you go, sport on the right hand side is equal to soccer. With that, I think we're finally ready for the first challenge. Let's recap to see what we need to do. Alright, here's challenge one again. Your job is to create a program that asks the user for their first name and then their last name. Use these inputs to print the following sentence. Your full name is whatever the first name is and then whatever their last name is. You know how to complete the majority of this challenge, but the last part requires you to build the string. There are a few ways to do this, but you need to find the answer on your own before proceeding to the next challenge. Building strings is a common and powerful technique in programming. It's a really good thing to learn, but so is learning how to learn. There will always be things you don't know. Learning and finding answers is also a skill. As you try to complete the challenges, Take advantage of the resources around you. You got instructors and mentors, other classmates, the community, me, shoot, there's a bunch of stuff out there to help you. And with that, I'll see you in the next part where I provide an answer. Good luck. I hope you were able to complete the challenge successfully. We'll go over a solution that I've written right now. But notice how I say a solution and not the solution. That's because there are a lot of ways to do this. For now, as you're learning, focus on what works. You may have come to this solution, but notice how the string in my print statement on line 8 starts with the lowercase f. This means I'm going to format the string. Then, I'm able to insert the first name right here and the last name right here using these curly braces. This string formatting style is called string interpolation. All right, challenge one is now complete. So let's push our new code from our computer and up into the cloud on GitHub. Git will keep track of all of our changes so we can review it before making official to the cloud. Here we are on Git Kraken, and already we can see that there are seven different changes we're sending up. But we really only made one file with a couple folders. So what are these other additions that it's tracking for us? Here on the right hand side, we can see the changes that have been made. Here's our chapters, chapter one, first program.py, but everything else above it is this dot idea thing. There may be things that we don't want to send up, like this idea folder, so let's add it to our gitignore file first. I'll close my first program.py, and I'm going to open this gitignore file. Now, there's a bunch of things in here, but really, all we need to add is the things that we don't want to be sending up to the cloud. These kinds of files would include things that are automatically built, or that only matter to my laptop. I don't need to send everything up. So all of those .idea folders we want to ignore. And all we need to do here is put .idea and that will take care of it. Switching back over to Git Kraken, now we can see that those seven or eight changes now drastically got decreased to the two that we did. There's the git ignore change that we added. Let's click on this to view it. And yep, sure enough, it says, hey, two green lines, green meaning added new lines, with idea being included. We can also click on our first program.py here to see the changes that happened in this file. 
Once we're happy with our changes, in order to push this up it's really easy. We just look at these two files and select anything that we want to stage. In our case we want to stage everything, so we'll click this green button, Stage All Changes. Staging files really just means that you get a preview as to what you're going to be sending up to the cloud right before you do it. If you wanted to get rid of those changes, you could simply click Unstage All Changes and you'd revert right back to the state you were in before. But, like I said, we like all of our changes, so Stage All Changes, and we're happy with these two files. The next thing we do is add a summary for what we changed, and here I'm just going to put Challenge 1. You can also add a description if you'd like to, but this is optional and I don't feel like we really need to, so I'm just going to leave this summary here. Once we're happy with our commit message, then we'll click this big green commit changes. And now we can see that there are now two rows here. This first row, master, shows my origin. Origin is a fancy name for what's currently on the cloud right now. The second one up here is my local. This is what's currently on my laptop. So notice how they're different from each other. What's on my laptop is not the same as what's online. So in order for us to push the changes that we have locally to our cloud, all we need to do is click Push. Once that's successful, now we can see that both local and what's on the cloud are on the same line. This means that what's on my local machine is the same as what's on the cloud. So we're all set here. So let's do a quick recap of the steps that we took in order to push the changes to the cloud. Step 1, we clicked Stage All Changes for the changes that we wanted to push up. Step 2 was to add a commit message, just a brief description as to what the changes you're making are for. Step 3 was to confirm not just the commit message, but also the change that we wanted to push up. And we did this by clicking the big green commit button. And lastly, step 4 was to push everything from our local machine up into the cloud. And all we did was click push. The last challenge will be yours to complete on your own. Take everything you've learned so far and apply it. For challenge two, create a program that asks the user for a season of the year, then a number, and then an adjective. Use these inputs to print the following sentence. On an adjective season day, I drink at least number cups of juice. Before you write the challenge, make sure that you add a new file to your chapter 1 directory. If you remember, we created chapters, chapter 1, and then first program.py. For challenge 2, just call this challenge2.py. Once you're done, push the code up to GitHub and you're all set. I'll see you in chapter 2. Good luck!